Father, we thank you for your presence. As we go into your word, we humble ourselves under your mighty hand. We pray for fresh unction and anointing from heaven upon my heart and my lips so that I will speak indeed as I should as an oracle of God. I pray you put the same unction and anointing upon the ears and the hearts of all those who will hear me, those of us that are here physically present, those who will hear me remotely, electronically, so that the word will flow, Father, freely from you through me to the people to do an internal and eternal work in every heart, including mine. In particular, to cause our wills to become more humble, minds to be more enlightened with revelation knowledge, emotions to be more tempered and controlled by the power of the fruit of the Holy Spirit. I further pray as I speak that the power of the Spirit of God be released in sufficient measure to follow these words and back them wherever they are heard and released in all the earth. Power that will heal, power that will deliver, power that will break yokes, power that will free men so that they will become doers of what they hear and not hearers only. We also pray for mercy to be faithful as I deliver the word. And indeed, I will do it with precision. Redeem the time and say only what you want me to say. Bring it out of the treasure of this word, things new and old, as a scribe instructed unto the kingdom. In Jesus' wonderful name we pray. And all is in agreement with me, receiving every blessing I mention in that prayer in your own individual life, agreed with me individually and said, Amen. 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 Praise the Lord. We want to welcome everybody again in the name of the Lord Jesus Christ to our worship service. Today is Pentecost Sunday. And um, I have a word uh, that the Lord has given me concerning today. This is the third Pentecost, the third literal Pentecost, and uh, God has given me this word, and it is uh, entitled, Shining from Zion, Shining from Zion. Uh, in order to be able to appreciate what I'm about to say, we need to understand uh, the Old Testament and what God did in the past, and therefore what God is doing now. Um, I'm going to read what the Lord gave me. Uh, he gave me a short word here. And then I'm going to go to the scriptures and expantiate on it so that we can appreciate the significance of this Pentecost that we're experiencing. Actually, today is Sunday. Pentecost actually started on Friday. Friday was actually 50 days from uh, Passover. Passover in the Old Testament, when the children of Israel came out of Egypt, the, they came out on Friday. That was the day that the angel of death passed over and all the firstborn of Egypt were, died. Then they left Egypt the second day. That second day became the day of first fruits. And it was that from, they counted from that Passover 50 days. After they came out, 50 days after they came out, they were camped in Mount Sinai. And it was on that day, God literally came down. He came down in fire. He came down in power. He came down in glory for one purpose. To give them the Ten Commandments. What we call the, ten, the actual Ten Commandments. There were a lot of other commandments, but that day, he, he specified those ten. And he spoke them with an audible voice. So that all of Israel, everybody heard it. They heard it with their ears, physically and audibly. And there was a, a manifestation of God's presence. There was fire on the mountain. And there was a long sound of a trumpet. And all of them were trembling. Even Moses himself, you know. And, and that was the purpose of the first Pentecost. To give them the law of the Ten Commandments. Now, today, the this, this second Pentecost happened 2,000 years ago in Jerusalem when the Holy Spirit, the same day of Pentecost, the Bible said when the day of Pentecost was fully come, the same thing happened, but now it was in the New Testament. God came down again. Now, he didn't come down on a physical mountain. He came down into the upper room in the same fire, and then he now gave them, he filled them with the Holy Spirit, and they began to speak in tongues. And with that uh, pr prayer language, supernatural prayer language, they were supposed to now use that to 
demonstrate God's wisdom, God's power, and God's glory, which that generation did. Uh, we need to understand something special about our second Pentecost. You see, Jesus had been around for 33 years. Then he died. He was raised again from the dead. For 40 days, he was teaching them from the scriptures. On the 40th day, he ascended. That was why last Sunday was Ascension Sunday. Then he told them, the next, he didn't tell them the next 10 days, but he just told them, go to Jerusalem and wait to be endued with power from on high. And 10 days later, which was the day of Pentecost, he now sent the Holy Spirit, and that Holy Spirit now came upon them, and they began to speak in tongues. Man had never seen anything like it before. It was already recorded by Isaiah in Isaiah chapter 28. He says, with stammering lips and another tongues, I'll speak to these people. But that was now the fulfillment of it. And with that power, they went into Jerusalem and began to preach and teach. First day, 3,000 people got uh, born again or 5,000. And then a few days later, Peter and John healed the man at the gate of uh, gate of, called beautiful at a temple and the trip man who was crippled from his mother's womb over 40 years of age began to walk so much so that everybody the whole of jerusalem was agog so to speak and even the scribes and the pharisees they said that these men have done a notable miracle and we cannot deny it we hear great things happened after that sent second pentecost uh, one particular thing i would like to point out here is the fact that peter you know the bible says that peter and the 12 apostles said the people magnified them and peter would walk through the streets of jerusalem and they brought the sick people from all over that even if the shadow without prayer no prayer no prayer the shadow of Peter will just pass across and the Bible says all of them were healed. Let's go to Acts chapter 5. I, I wanna, I'm, 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 calm, I'm building up to our own Pentecost today. Because it's important to look at what God has done in the past. Then you can then understand what God is doing now and what God is going to do in the future. Acts chapter 5. And there's a very important comment I want to make uh, uh, on this. Acts chapter 5, right. This was in this time of Pentecost. The day of Pentecost had passed. This was a few days, weeks later, you know, in this season of the glory of God that had come on the 120 that were in the upper room. And the Bible says, and by the hands of the apostles, I didn't hear you folks, were many signs and wonders wrought among the people and they were all with one accord in Solomon's porch. And of the rest, does no man join himself to them, but the people magnified them. And believers were the more added to the Lord, multitudes of men, of both men and women. In so much, in so much, I didn't hear you, that they brought forth the sick into the streets and laid them on beds and couches, that at least... The shadow of Peter passing might overshadow some of them. There came also a multitude. Turn your neighbor and say, that's not a few. A multitude. Anytime the Bible says multitude in the Bible, they're looking at 5,000, 10,000 people. What I'm about to say is going to blow you. There came also a multitude out of the cities round about Jerusalem. That it wasn't just Jerusalem alone, all the, all, the, all the locality around Jerusalem, like here in Ibadan, for example, there would be places like Oyo, you know, and, and some, of the city, you know, some of the cities that are close to us here. Round about bringing sick folks and them which were vexed with unclean spirits and they were healed a few. And they were healed many. This is duplicating what Jesus did in his ministry. Now, I want to make a statement that I'm sure many of us may not have thought deeply about. I myself, I didn't think deeply about this until some years ago when the Lord pointed it out to me. This was still a baby church. They had been born again only on the day, on, 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 on Easter Sunday. They were not born again before. Under Jesus' ministry, they had the borrowed anointing. 
They heal the sick, they cleanse the lepers and all of that. You see that same borrowed anointing in operation. It could never have been as a result of growth or inheritance. It's not possible. There was no time to grow. They were, they were, they were, they, you, you, you can even see that from their, from their actions. You know, I spoke this morning when I was teaching in the Bible study that Peter, you know, God, he had, his mind was not renewed enough to even go to the Gentiles. So we, I know it's not growth. This was a continuation of the borrowed anointing that was under the Lord Jesus Christ. Are you listening to me? There is a reason why I am saying this because of this Pentecost that we are experiencing or we are uh, experiencing now. The reason is this. It was that same borrowed anointing that carried the early church through the first about 70, 80, 100 years. All these apostles, all the 12 of them, then some of their disciples, later on Paul, and some of their disciples that they trained, you know, were doing miracles. And the Bible says this of them. He said, they that have turned the world upside down are come hither also. They turned the entire Roman Empire upside down. But alas, alas, something happened. And that's why we need this third Pentecost that we are celebrating today or commemorating today and uh, trusting God for an, a fresh outpouring of the Holy Spirit. And it is this. After that first hundred years, these miracles stopped. That's why traditional evangelical Christians, or they call them cessational Christians, they say that, oh, all the miracles stopped with the early apostles, and because we now have the Bible, we don't need miracles anymore. That's not true. That is not true. It cannot be true, because Jesus said, the works that he did, we will do, and greater works. They did the works Jesus did, but they didn't do the greater works. So that scripture has not been fulfilled, number one. Number two, the Bible tells us that God gave us apostles, prophets, evangelists, pastors, and teachers for the perfecting of the saints, for the work of the ministry, for the edifying of the body of Christ, till we all come into the unity of the faith and the knowledge of the Son of God, unto a perfect man, unto the measure of the stature of the fullness of Christ. That we be no more children, tossed to and fro with every wind of doctrine, whereby the lying way to deceive, by the slight of men in cunning craftiness, whereby the lings to see. But... But, speaking the truth in love, the language of love, and I'm going to connect all of that in a minute, but speak, may grow up into him in all things. That has not happened yet. And that is why we needed a third Pentecost. The first Pentecost, what it did basically was this. It got the church upon got the church started, laid the foundation of the apostles and prophets, gave us the New Testament that would complement the Old Testament and fulfill its job. It is this third day. When I say third day now, I mean the third 1,000 year period from the birth of Christ. This third, the Bible calls one day with the Lord as a thousand years. So when we say third day, we're talking about the third millennium from the birth of Christ, which is the time we're in. We actually entered this third day in 1996 because Jesus was born about 4 BC, 1995, 1996. So we are about 25 years now into the third day. And it is in this third day, the Lord Jesus said, I will be perfected. He was not talking about his own day. Jesus was already perfect, you know. He, you know, he had the glory of God and everything. He wasn't talking about himself. He was talking about his body. And he was not talking about three 24-hour periods. He was talking prophetically about the end-time church. He said, the third day I'll be affected. He said, the first and second days I cast out devils and do cures. He said, but the third day I will be perfected. The church cannot be perfected without a third outpouring of the Spirit that we usher us into the perfection and the fullness of Christ that will now do these same things and greater. For in Haggai, the Bible says that the glory of this latter house 
will be greater than that of the former. In other words, what we are going, the glory we are going to see now is going to exceed what we saw on the day of Pente- the second Pentecost. But how is this thing going to be? And this is the crux of my message of God shining through Zion. The first Pentecost which occurred in Israel, God came down in the fire on Mount Sinai 50 days. That's where, uh, where Pentecost really comes from. The word Pentecost is a, is a, is a Greek, comes from the Greek penti, means 50, you know. <clears throat> so the first 50 days, after the first 50 days coming out of Egypt, God came down on Mount Sinai and he did it for a purpose. Let's quickly go to Exodus chapter 19. And I'm going to come to the second Pentecost and then I'll come to the, th- I'm going to come to the third Pentecost. Exodus chapter 19. And uh, I'm not going to read everything because of time. I'll just uh, 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 skip some things and I'll uh, tell you what happened. Okay. Now, <clears throat> and the Lord, look at verse 10, Exodus chapter 19. And the Lord said unto Moses, I didn't hear you, go unto the people and sanctify them. Look at it, today and tomorrow. Let them wash their clothes. That to us today, that speaks to us of cleaning the physical body with the life and the power of the Holy Spirit. The Bible says, having our bodies washed with pure water. The, our, our bodies are like the clothing of our spirits. And be ready against the third day. That was actually the Friday, this last Friday. For the third day, the Lord will come down. Observe these words. In the sight of some of the people. Upon Mount Sinai, and thou shalt set bounds unto the people round about, saying, Take heed to yourselves, that you know you go not up into the mount, or touch the border of it, for whosoever toucheth the mount shall surely be put to death, and so on and so forth. And then he, you know, he, he, he goes on to tell them that they, didn't, they shouldn't sleep with their wives, like fasting, you know, that they should be ready. Then, verse 16, And it came to pass, I didn't hear you, on the third day, in the morning, incidentally, the second Passover was at 9 o'clock in the morning, the one in the upper room, same time. Same, about the same time. Don't tell us here 9 o'clock, but just says in the morning. You know? And there were thunders. I didn't hear you. And lightnings. And a thick cloud upon the mount. And the voice of the trumpet. Exceeding loud. That all the people in the camp, what? Trembled. And Moses brought forth the people out of the camp to meet with God. And they stood at the nether part. In other words, they didn't come near the mountain. The mountain was here. They were standing you know, near the border of the mountain. You know, if you, if you see a mountain, you find that you know, it starts to progress gradually. So they were at the base. <clears throat> and Mount Sinai was altogether on a smoke. Because the Lord descended upon it in what? Fire. What do you see on the day of Pentecost? Fire. And the smoke thereof ascended as the smoke of a furnace, and the whole mount quaked greatly. It was like an earthquake. There was a purpose for all of this. I'm going to get to it in a minute. And when the voice of the trumpet sounded long and waxed louder and louder, Moses spoke, and God answered him, how? By a voice. And the Lord came down upon Mount Zion on the top of the mount. And the Lord called Moses up to the top of the mount. And Moses went up. Notice the people stayed down. And the Lord said unto Moses, go down and charge the people. Lest they break through unto the Lord to gaze and many of them perish. They were not allowed to come close to come and see what was going on. But Moses was. And the Lord, and Moses said unto the Lord, The people cannot come up to Mount Sinai, for thou hast charged us, saying, Set bounds about the mount and sanctify it. And the Lord said unto him, Away! Get thee down, and thou shalt come up and Aaron with thee. But let not the priests and the people break through to come up unto the Lord, lest he 
break forth upon them. So Moses went down on the people and he spoke to them. Chapter 20. And God spake all these words, saying, I am the Lord thy God that brought thee out of the land of Egypt, out of that. This is 50 days after they left Egypt. Thou shalt have no other gods but me. You know, that's commandment number one. You know, and then you not take the name of the Lord in vain. I don't want to read all of that. Uh, the six days you keep, and then the seventh day is the Sabbath. Honor your father and your mother that your days may be long. You shall not kill, you will not commit adultery, nor steal, you will not bear false witness, you will not covet your neighbor's wife, and so on and so forth. And the, watch this. And the people saw the thunderings and the lightnings and the noise of the trumpet and the mouth smoking. And when the people saw it, they removed <laughs> and stood afar off. Then, and they said unto Moses, Speak thou with us, and we will hear. But let not God speak with us, lest we die. Verse 20. And Moses said unto the people, and God is still saying the same thing to every Christian and all of us today, Fear not. For God is come to prove you that his fear may be before your faces that you sin not. And all the people stood afar off. And Moses drew near the thick darkness where God was. So the first Pentecost, there was a spectacular manifestation of God's presence in fire, in glory. And in, it was out of that God now spoke and gave them the Ten Commandments. He did it in this spectacular way to give put into them a healthy fear of God so that they would take heed to those commandments and they would practice them and actually obey them. Now, fast forward to the second Pentecost. And let's go to Acts chapter 2. And I'm just going to read the first four verses. You know, and when the day of Pentecost, this is the second Pentecost, was fully come, they were all with one accord in one place. No wonder God put coronavirus right now, and I'm going to show you that from scripture in a minute. You know, we're all in our homes, you know, in churches like this, you know, where we gather in small groups to make the recording of the service. And God has so arranged it for Christians who have the right heart. All of us are seeking one thing now. And you know what that one thing is? A fresh outpouring of the Spirit. So we are in one accord. Suddenly, there came a sound from heaven, just like in time of Moses, of a rushing mighty wind, and it filled all the house where they were sitting. And there appeared unto them cloven tongues like as of fire. Notice in the first Pentecost, there was fire. And it sat upon each of them, and they were all filled with the Holy Ghost and began to speak in other tongues as the Spirit gave them utterance. This is Pentecost number 2. Now, God is going to now do a third Pentecost in this season and time of Pentecost. But instead of God coming down like He did on Mount Sinai, 3,000 years ago, he is now going to come down on Mount Zion. Glory be to God. Now, look at Hebrews chapter 12. Hebrews chapter 12. <clears throat> now, let, 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 me, let me read. Um, I'm just going to read. I'm just going to read from verse, verse 22. is really where I want to start. But you see, Paul, by the Holy Spirit, contrasts the two mountains. So he now says in verse 20, For they could not endure that which was commandment. And if so much as a beast touched the mountain, it shall be stoned or thrust through there. So terrible was the sight, I didn't hear you, that Moses said, I exceedingly, even Moses was afraid. Moses who knew God very well. Who had, you know, and he said, I exceedingly fear and quick. But, you, you and I, are come unto Mount Zion, unto the city of the living God, the heavenly Jerusalem, unto an innumerable company of angels, 
unto the general assembly and church of the firstborn, which are written to heaven, and to God the judge of all, and the spirits of just men made perfect, and to Jesus, to Jesus the mediator of the new covenant, and to the blood of sprinkling that speaketh of better things than of Abel. Verse 25 is a warning to this generation in this day and season of Pentecost. See that you refuse not him that speaketh. I'm going to share some things with us in a few minutes. See that you don't refuse. Let me, let me, let me back up a little bit. You know what happened to Israel? If you read chapter 19 of Exodus, I don't have time to go into all the details at that particular Pentecost, it was only 50 days after they had come out, God had not even ordained the priesthood. The only person that was supporting um, 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 uh, Moses was Aaron and his sons. The priesthood, the, the priest guardments have not been made. The priests, the tabernacle had not been made. Nothing had been done. You know what God said to them? He said, I'm going to make all of you a kingdom of priests. That was God's plan. I'm going to make you a kingdom of priests. If you will listen to my story, all of you. It was when, and this will not be our portion in Jesus' name, when they refused. That's why he says here to us in the New Testament, see that you refuse it not. It, where, let me say it in this way. It, it, the people who refused, because, of, because Israel refused, God now said, okay, you don't want to be my priests. All right, don't worry. I will just take one tribe. Just one tribe, like a tithe. I just take Levi alone. Then even that Levi, I will now from Levi, I will now select people who are worthy, who become priests. Today, God is speaking to the New Testament church. He is coming down in a fresh outpouring of his glory. And he is saying, I want you to become a kingdom of kings and priests. What I was preaching during the Bible study today, you know, and Paul is telling us, the Holy Spirit through Paul said that we should not refuse this New Testament law that is going to come out of Zion. In the Old Testament, he gave them the Ten Commandments. Today, he is revealing two laws to us, the New Testament church. One, the law of the spirit of life in Christ Jesus that has set us free from the law of sin and death. The second law is a law that, you know, uh, it's amazing how we don't connect this. You know, whenever you, if you talk to the average Christian and say, what is the law? They say, love your neighbor as yourself. You know, or they quote the Old Testament law. You know, thou shalt love the Lord thy God and then thou shalt love thy neighbor. But that's not the New Testament law. The New Testament law is found uh, in, in, in 1 John, let's go there. 1 John chapter 3 in verse 22. Verse 23, let me, because of time. Say, and this is his commandment, that we should believe on the name of his son Jesus Christ and love one another as he gave us commandment. Slow down. How did he give us commandments? In John chapter 13, he said, love one another as I have loved you. He did not say, love one another as you love your neighbor. So the New Testament commandment is higher than the Old Testament commandment because it demands divine love, not human love. And that divine love can only be uh, practiced, can only be fulfilled through divine life. So he prefaces our law with belief on the name of his, Lord Je or of his son Jesus Christ. Now these are people who already believe on the name of Jesus Christ. These are people who are already born again. So he's not talking about using the name to get born again. He's talking about using the name to get divine life. John 20, 31. He says that we might have life through his name. So what is God doing today? God today, as he's going to be pouring out a fresh spirit, of wisdom and revelation upon the church in this third Pentecost is to shine in our minds a clear, fresh revelation of these two laws. The law of the spirit of life in Christ Jesus 
and the law of uh, uh, life, I call it the law of life and love. The law that gives you life through the name of Jesus, by which you can now love as God loves. To love as God loves, you need three things. You need divine wisdom, which is light. You need divine compassion. And you need divine power, ability to do what God would do in every circumstance and situation. You cannot do it by natural human means. And you need revelation to be able to walk in this kind of love. And to keep the law of the spirit of life in Christ Jesus. So, in this third Pentecost, God is shining from Mount Zion. Not Mount Sinai, like he did 3,000 years ago, not even in the upper room in Jerusalem. He's now shining from Mount Zion. Now, go to uh, Psalm 50. It's amazing. I only saw this this morning. I preached from all these scriptures over the years. But this aspect I'm about to share with you, I only saw it this morning as I was praying and waiting upon the Lord. And in fact, I had another message that had been prepared, which I'm still going to give, not today, you know, on another day. And God said to me, he said, you need, because today is Pentecost Sunday, you need to preach this message, which is called Shining from Zion, or God Shining from Zion. That's, that's how he titled it for me. He says, out of Zion, the perfection of beauty, God hath what? Shined out of Zion. The perfection of beauty. This is how we know that Zion is symbolic of the perfect church. Out. Notice, it, it's God who is doing the shining, but he's doing it through and out of Zion. It, Zion is going to be the vehicle. Zion is going to be the avenue through which this light will now shine to the rest of the church. In our scripture, it's in Psalm 14, and I think it's also one of the other Psalms. It's exactly the same scripture repeated. He says, oh, that the salvation of Israel will come where? Out of Zion. And our God shall come. Turn to your neighbor and say, our God shall come. And shall not keep silence. This is a prophetic present truth now word to the Zion church, to, to the church today. God is going to come. He's coming now by his spirit to us afresh. And he will not keep silence. A fire. Remember there was fire in the first one. There was fire in the second one. And there's going to be fire in the third one. Now let me just quickly say something. You know, it doesn't necessarily mean we're going to see physical, you know, physically see fire. He's talking about the fire of the power of the Holy Spirit. That is going to burn up. The sin, the sin nature still the residue in the soul and body and purify the sons of Levi. So that's why. So you, you, we, may, we may see the manifestation of fire here and there. It's possible. But don't go looking for fire. Hello? Look for the commandments. On the day of the first Pentecost, the fire was not the important thing. It was the commandment that came. The fire was to grab their attention so they would pay attention to the commandment and have the fear of God to do it. Hallelujah. So he says, A fire shall devour before him. It shall be very what? Temptuous round about him. Folks, tough days are ahead. You know why? This fire that God is bringing it's going to cause a separation in the church. It's going to separate the wheat from the tares. The Bible says, Jesus himself said this. He said, think not I've come to bring peace. He said, but I've gone to bring division. From henceforth, in one house, three against two, two against three, mother-in-law against a daughter-in-law. He says, I am, come, I am bringing a fire. You find it in Luke, you know, uh, What's that? Get, get me that scripture. It's not in my notes here. You know, I think it's Luke chapter 12. He says, I'm come as a fire. Luke chapter 12, I believe it is. Oh, yes. Luke chapter 12. Uh, has anybody found that scripture? 49. Thank you. Good. 
Now, this is Jesus talking. He's talking prophetically to the third day church. He says, I am come to send fire on earth. But what will I until uh, will I, if it be already kindled? I have a baptism to be baptized with and how straightened I am until it be accomplished. From henceforth, you know, and talked about the uh, division. This fire is going to cause, you know, a division. Let's go back to Psalm 50. This fire is going to cause a division. Not a division in a bad kind of way. It's going to be a separation. The wheat from the chaff. Gold and silver separated from wood, hay and stubble. This, this fire is going to bring it. In fact, you know, I, I got to say what the Lord told me. You know, I, I, some, some of these things are, sometimes we're reluctant to say because they are heavy. Now, go to, I'm going to come back to this fire in Psalm 50. These scriptures, they're coming to me now by the Holy Spirit. Look at Zechariah chapter 13. You're going to see that fire again. Zechariah chapter 13 and look at verse 7. Okay. <clears throat> that this is what he says. He says, and it shall come to pass that in all the land, or you can say in all the church, said the Lord, two parts, that's why it's going to be tempestuous round about him, shall be cut off and die, and, but the third shall be left therein. You know, if you look at the tabernacle of Moses, you find that one third of the tabernacle is the holy place and the most holy place. Two thirds is the outer court. So what God is saying is that this fire that's going to come is going to cause a separation. And I will bring, I didn't hear you, the third part through the fire and will refine them as silver is refined, and try them as gold is tried, and they shall call on my name, and I will hear them, and I will say, it is my people, and they shall say, it is my God. In other words, the, this fire, this third one that is coming, is going to refine those who in their hearts, and we're going to see that in another minute when I go back to Psalm 50, you know, respond to this law that God is going to give them. They turn in their hearts towards God. So the fire will now refine them and cause them to come out pure. A, a, a glorious church, not having spot, blemish, wrinkle or any sort of thing. And they will carry the glory of God. The other two thirds, it doesn't mean they will go to hell. But it means that, you know, the, the, the fire, instead of refining them, the fire will destroy them. Like it says of the boy in Corinth, he says, deliver him to Satan for the destruction of the flesh, that the spirit may be saved in the day of Christ. That's a very sad thing to happen to anybody. Hence, this prophetic message. It's being sent forth on this third Pentecost, that a fire is it's already here, actually, and it's going to keep increasing in this season of Pentecost, and its purpose is to refine gold and silver. But you know, even in the natural the same fire that refines gold and silver, what does it do to wood and earth? It burns it up. It's not the fault of the fire, it's the fault of the material. So what you need to do now, in response to this message I'm giving you, is to make sure you develop and cultivate a heart of gold and a heart of silver. Stop messing around with wood, hair and stubble. Now let's go back to Psalm 50. All this is not in my notes. It's all coming by revelation. God just gave me, it's a prophetic message. He just gave me a push this morning when I was praying. You know, that you need to go and say, teach them about this. God shining through from, from Mount Zion. So, verse 3, Psalm 50. It shall be very temptatious. That's why it's going to be temptatious. Because two thirds are going to be cut off. And one third will be taken through this fire of refinement, and that fire of refinement will now cause them to be able to carry the glory. <laughs> Let me just quit. You know, the Holy Ghost, I'm just getting all these texts and, and, and beeps from heaven. You know, you see, these people who refine themselves will carry the glory that Jesus carried. The reason why, after the first 100 years, that the glory stopped. And that's, that's what happened in history. And people thought, you know, the, the miracles are stopped. It hadn't stopped. There were no longer any vessels to carry it. The initial disciples like John and some of their initial disciples that carried the glory, they got instructions from Jesus via the apostles, via Paul, 
Timothy, you know, but you can see from the book of Revelation, which we're studying, in the seven churches, that even as early as that time, so many bad leaders had come up and they were taking the people away from what the original apostles did. So, a lot of the, of the, of the instructions of carrying the glory was lost and died with that generation. So there were no more miracles, and before we knew it, in 300 years, Constantinople became a Christian, and then the Roman Catholic Church took over the church, and you know what happens, we entered the Dark Ages. But thank God for restoration. Hallelujah. So God now is going to restore what the original apostles had, and greater. That, 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 that revelation that died with them is now being restored to us. It has always been in the word, but it was hidden. It, it was hidden like it was sealed until this time. Until the time. God is now unsealing this, this, this revelation. Hence, this third Pentecost is going to bring light that will unseal this commandment that is going to cause us to be carriers of the glory. And it's those two commandments, basically. The law of the spirit of life in Christ Jesus and the law of sin and death. Law of spirit of life in Christ Jesus, clean with the blood, load with the word, fire by the spirit. You now use that to walk in love. And you do it Four times a day, you know, every six hours and at every opportunity, you pray in the spirit, you know, with, 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 with great, uh, effectually and fervently, you pump the power of God from your inner man into the soul, into the body, into the, into the, into the, into the circumstances, and it burns up the sin. That's the fire. It burns up the sin. As you do that consistently, you qualify. Watch and pray always that you may be kind of worthy. You now qualify to carry the glory. Hallelujah. And this one, we will not die. We will live and declare the glory of God. We are going to go out of here in a blaze of glory. Hallelujah. We are going to carry the glory until we are raptured. Glory be to God. What happened in the first century is not going to repeat itself. We are going to close the age in a blaze of glory. Hallelujah. But I'm not done yet. So, the Holy Spirit is speaking present truth. This Psalm 50 is a prophetic psalm speaking to us. It is not speaking to Pentecostal, the Christians of the first century. There's an application there. But he's speaking more to us now in this third day. So, you know what he says? He says, he shall call to the heavens from above. And to the earth, that he may judge his people. You know, the church has not been doing what God told them to do. My message for next week, which is the one I, didn't, I prepared, but it's not for today. God showed me this one is the one for today. It's called, It is Time to Follow Jesus. You know, the church has not been following Jesus. We've been following our own idea of what Jesus is. And the word, Greek word follow is the word mimic. Don't let me go there. Because it is not for today. Amen. That's why he's going to judge people. Do you know what he says in verse 5? He says, gather my saints together. And those that have made covenant with me by sacrifice. Those are the people who are going to carry the glory. It's not the whole church. No, nah, it's, it's to the whole church. The invitation is to everybody. But you, the thing that is going to make you qualify for this glory, for this fire that is coming, is that you make covenant with God. One on one, each of us will make a covenant with God by sacrifice. What does that mean? I got scripture for you. This is a, you know, a wonderful prophetic message. It's just coming by the Spirit of God. Romans chapter 12. Sacrifice. Romans chapter 12 verses 1 and 2. I beseech you therefore when God begs you, be afraid. I beseech you. I am beseeching every Christian this Pentecost. Day of Pentecost and in this Pentecostal season. I'm begging you like Paul did. 2000. By the mercies of God, 
That's why God had me preach that message a few weeks ago. Practicing the word of God by the mercies of God. Notice it cannot be done without the mercies of God. And it's not one mercy. It's mercies. Uh, plural. That you present your bodies. That is where our problem is. The sin nature in the flesh and in the soul. A living sacrifice. Those who have made covenant with me by sacrifice. The Christian who says, God, I'm making a covenant with you. This third Pentecost, I make a covenant now that I am going to present this body by the mercies of God. I'm going to present it a living sacrifice. Those are the saints that have made covenant by sacrifice. And uh, we are holy, acceptable unto God, which is your reasonable service or your spiritual service. And be not conformed to this world. Conform to this world. What is this world? The law, of the, the lust of the flesh, the lust of the eyes, and the pride of life. In other words, don't allow your body or your mind. Observe those three things cover the soul and the body. The lust of the flesh is the body. The lust of the eyes is in the mind. Is in the mind, will, and emotions. The pride of life is in the mind, will, and emotions. So those are the things you have to bring to the altar. And allow the fire... To come upon that, come upon that body, come upon that soul, and burn out the sin nature, so you can carry the glory. But be ye transformed. That's the word metamorpho. That's where we get the English word metamorphosis from. It's a transformation by the renewing of your mind, that you may prove experientially and sequentially what is the good acceptable and then ultimately the perfect will of God. He's talking about going on to perfection. So the church, the saints, is going to be on an individual one-on-one -on -one basis. God is speaking to every one of us now. You decide now. Make a covenant with God by sacrifice. So you can carry the glory. Then I want to talk about the mind as I close. How is the mind going to be renewed? That's the reason for the third Pentecost. The first Pentecost, God spoke in an audible voice and all Israel heard it. In this Pentecost, God is speaking by his spirit and shining light out of Zion into our minds. 2 Corinthians chapter 4, verse 6. It's amazing how all these things just, you know, seamlessly tied together. For God who commanded I didn't hear you. The light to shine out of darkness had shined. Now I'm going to put something here from the, from, from, from the Holy Spirit. Had shined from Zion into our hearts to give the light of the knowledge of the glory of God that is in the face of Jesus Christ. So the light that is shining now from Zion is going to shine into your heart if it's conditional. If you make covenant with God by sacrifice. If the if is there. You need, that's why there's a message now for every single one of us individually. This is the time to say, God, I'll make a covenant with you. I'm going to deliver this body and this mind. I'm going to deliver them to, and I'm going to allow your fire to burn out the sin nature through regular prayer in the spirit, an attitude of meekness and lowliness of heart, fear of the Lord, prayer. I'm going to deal with all that next week. You know. Now, just before I, I close, there's a scripture, and I mentioned this, I believe, on Wednesday, but let me use it. I think Proverbs is going to be the one I'm going to close with. It's in Proverbs chapter 20, chapter 1, as in verse 29. No, it's, uh, it's not verse 29. Where is it now? It's, uh, uh, yes, it's verse 23. Here, Solomon is speaking prophetically about the wisdom of God, like he did in chapter 9. Chapter 9 says, wisdom hath built a house. He's talking about the church. And, has, you know, hewn out her seven pillars. These are the seven principles of perfection. Here in chapter 1, he's speaking to the third day church prophetically. It's a present day word to all of us now. Before I read verse 23, I want to read from verse 20. 
Because we now get the full context of what God is saying and what our response should be. And that's why he said in Psalm 50, Gather to me my saints who have made covenant with me by sacrifice. Incidentally, in Hebrews chapter 8 verse 12, he tells us exactly what the covenant is. He said, this is the covenant I w- that will write my laws upon their heart. That's why every day, watch what I'm about to say. This is very important. Every day from now, if you've not been doing it, and if you've been doing it, you have to continue to do it with even greater diligence and greater consistency. You must write that law on your heart. So every day, you say, Lord, have mercy on me. I receive your blood to cleanse from all righteousness, you know, your life and your power. And I say, I love the Lord my God with all my heart, with all my strength, and with all my might. And I love my brethren and all men as Christ loves them. You write it. You're making covenant with, you're making sacrifice with God by covenant. You write it upon your heart. That's the covenant. You write it upon your heart every day by the Spirit of God. You know what's going to happen? After you do that consistently six months, a year, a year, four months, you know what's going to happen? You will be programmed. When anything comes up, the first thing you're going to do is respond in love. So the other day I was teaching about casting out fear and perfecting the love of God. You see, the, the love of God has four posts or, or four legs, if you like. It, moves, it goes from your spirit to your soul, body, circumstances, and regional heavenlies. But watch this. To move into your spirit, the connection, the umbilical cord between you and God has to be clean. That's why you need the blood. That's why perfection can never come without the blood. You say, Father, I confess my sins. This is the law of the spirit of life in Christ Jesus operating. And then the blood of Jesus Christ now removes the block between you and God. And then you receive more life and more power. When you receive more life, because the love of God comes from the life of God, you're receiving more of the love of God. So you receive more of the love. That's why we have that prayer. Say, We receive more life, more love, more joy, peace. So it goes into your spirit. Then when you now read the Bible, that is why praying in tongues is very important. But you have to read the Bible, not every day, and say those love confessions daily. You have to actually say it, because it is the reading and the saying of it that moves it from your spirit to your will and to your mind. If you don't say it in the language you understand, your, your mind does not get the consciousness of it. Your will is when you say it, you now determine in your will that I'm going to do it. So you now move it through the confession of God's word. That's why the Bible says, whoso keepeth his word, in him very least love come You cannot perfect the love of God by the blood alone. You cannot perfect it by the spirit alone. You need the word. So you need to keep the word. So every day you have to say it. I endure long and I'm patient and kind. I'm not envious. All that 1 Corinthians chapter 13. You say them on a daily basis. You say it. And then you determine to do it. So it moves from your spirit. And it goes into the mind and the will. Then when you now begin to pray in tongues. The spirit. The power of the power of the Holy Spirit. Now pushes it from the mind and the will and then where it has been where, where, where your consciousness has got it it now pushes it into the emotions into the body into the circumstances and into the heavenlies and then it runs its full course to run its full course therefore it needs the blood to get more of it into your spirit it needs the word to get it into your mind and into your will and then it needs the spirit to push it into your emotions into your bo- into your body into your circumstances into the regional heavenlies and then as it continues to perfect run its full course through you it begins to perfect you and it is that perfecting of you that we now qualify you for the glory observe you don't have to be perfect to carry the glory Judas was not perfect, obvious. Peter was not perfect, obvious. John was not perfect, obvious. Amen. But these simple instructions was what Jesus gave them. And they were doing it. And as they practiced it, and that power was going through them, within a year of following Jesus, Jesus said, you guys, you've, you've been following. Okay, come. Then he took some of the anointing on him, and he put it on them. And they carried the glory. Then shortly after, he got the 70. So, between now and the Feast of Tabernacles, which is in October, you need to now take this commandment that is shining now 
in Pentecost and start to practice. As you begin to do that, you begin to cleanse out the sin nature, you begin to dominate it, and you're going to now qualify to carry the glory. The glory is going to now, the power, the glory, the fullness, it will start from now, and then it's going to increase in momentum and grow into tabernacles and begin to bring in the harvest of the nations. Now, Proverbs chapter 1, and I believe I'll close with this. Wisdom! Wisdom! I didn't hear you. Wisdom. Proverbs chapter 1 verse 20. Wisdom. Cries without. She uttereth her voice in the streets. This reminds me of what we read this morning. He says, I stand at the door and knock. Where wisdom is crying, you should be crying inside, but it's crying outside. I want to enter your mind, but you have not opened the door. Wisdom cries without. She uttereth her voice in the streets. She Christ in the chief concourse, in the opening of gates, in the city she uttered. This message I'm giving you is a type, is, is, is a fulfillment of this. Because it's going onto the satellite, you know, on YouTube, in the whole world, people are, can listen to it. Wisdom is crying. Like I'm crying now. She's crying. She uttered the word saying, how long will you simple ones love simplicity? How long, you simple ones, will you lose simplicity? You know, we lost simplicity in the church. Oh, I don't want to hear about that. Oh, you know, God is love. He will just do everything for me automatically. No, 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 no. There are laws, there, there are principles by which God operates. The law of the spirit of life in Christ Jesus. Observe, Jesus never did anything haphazardly. He spoke with precision. He knew what he was doing. <clears throat> and scorners, turn to your neighbor and say, you will not be a scorner in Jesus' name. I will not be a scorner in Jesus' name. Delight in their scorner. Remember, a scorner seeketh wisdom and findeth it not. And fools hate knowledge. Verse 23. And I think I'm going to stop there. Turn you! Turn you! At my reproof. When the Lord gave me this, when he, he, he expanded this to me in my spirit, and he took me back to Moses, Moses saw the glory of God. He saw the fire in the burning bush. But God didn't talk. The Bible says, and Moses said, I will turn aside. Turn you. I will turn aside and see this great sight. The Bible says, when the Lord saw that Moses had turned, then the voice of God came. You now, in this Pentecost, all my brethren that are here in me, saints that are gathered, who make covenant with God by sacrifice, turn you at these words of wisdom. And he will make his words known unto you. When you have the right attitude, this light will shine in your mind and it's going to give you a fresh revelation and wisdom. It's not going to be revelation, it's going to be revelation and wisdom. Revelation tells you what wisdom tells you how you will get the revelation and then he will give you the wisdom of how to start practicing on a daily basis the law of the spirit of life in christ jesus and the law of life and love to begin to perfect the love of god in your life and prepare you for the glory that is coming let us pray hallelujah let's talk to god Hallelujah. Hallelujah. This is God, what God is saying. God is shining through Zion. Out of Zion. Zion is the perfect church. And the, uh, and the leaders there, they are preaching and teaching these things like I am doing now. And God is shining now through Zion to the rest of the church. Do not harden your heart. See, you refuse not him that speaketh from heaven. Make sure that you turn at this reproof so that you can receive this fresh revelation and wisdom of the law of the spirit of life in Christ Jesus and the law of life and love so that you can qualify to carry the glory in this end time. Let's talk to God.